Katie Shankle with JustPlainSomething.com, and we have a very special Let's Play today. Uh, it's called To Be or Not To Be, which was uh, done by Ryan North and a bunch of other people, and it's about Hamlet. Uh, and since I have an English degree and everything, I feel like this was the perfect game for me to try out. Huzzah! Let's start. William Shakespeare, 1564 A.D. to whenever he died, was well known for borrowing from existing literature when writing his plays. Romeo and Juliet is pretty much lifted entirely from Arthur Brooks' poem, The Tragical History of Romeus and Juliet. Dude didn't even change the names. And as recent Shakespeare scholarship has established, the famed play William Shakespeare Presents Hamlet was lifted wholesale from the volume you are about to enjoy, To Be or Not To Be. To Be or Not To Be is both the earliest recorded example of the books and <laughs> game genre, as well as the first instance ever in the then newish English language that was kicking around of an adventure being chosen by you, the reader. We've gone ahead and added illustrations, plus we've taken the liberty of marking with tiny York skulls the choices Shakespeare himself made when he plagiarized this book back in olden times. <laughs> They're there in case you wish to put yourself in Shakespeare's shoes, reading this book as he did, stealing plot elements wholesale, and classing up the language as he, slash you, went, slash go. However, that is not the only way to read this book. Feel free to explore your other options, as each time you read this book, you can go on a different adventure, assuming you don't read the book like three quadrillion times, at which point the adventures will start to repeat, and they'll probably seem pretty familiar long before then anyway. Now, take yourself back to history, when ghosts walked the earth and nobody knew velociraptors were even a thing. Steal yourself to experience the magic of Shakespeare as it was meant to be experienced, in a non-deterministic narrative structure where you end up thinking maybe you made a wrong decision, so you mark the pages you were just on, so you can always go back and make a different choice if you die for some dumb reason. To be or not to be, that is the adventure. Fun. Before Choose your character. Before I do Man. that... I'm actually going to turn down the sound. I don't know if it's as bad as... There, that's much better. Sorry, everyone. I, I really hope that you don't mind the fact that I turned off the music. I don't know how badly loud it is uh, in the recording, but in my ear, it's like... It, in my headset, it's crazy... I don't... The mic just told me I could turn down on the button on the headset. To be quite honest, I feel like it'll be easier for you to hear me if I can actually speak William without... William Shakespeare, 1564 oh, let's go to through whenever this. he died, was well known for borrowing from existing <laughs> Sorry, literature everyone. when writing his plays. Romeo and Juliet is pretty much lifted entirely from Arthur Brooks' poem. What Brooks's in the heck? Wait, let's try to do that again. Checkpoints, maybe? Please tell me I don't William have to do it again. William ah! Shakespeare, 1564 A.D. to whenever he died, was well known for borrowing skip. from existing Wait, I can literature. Skip. Ha ha! All right, choose my character. Um, and yes, there's Ryan North, who, if you have um, seen any of my articles, you'll know that Ryan North writes Squirrel Girl, who is one of my favorite heroines right now and is one of my favorite books of the year. So this was one of the other reasons why I really, really wanted to get this book. All right, choose your character. Man, what if I just read the acknowledges like said? You can't tell me what to do, smart guy. I'm just going to keep reading. Let's try that one. Whoa, whoa, whoa. slow down mm -hmm. there, cowboy. At the end of that last bit, you were supposed to make a choice and then jump to the page that reflects that choice. Instead of following those instructions, you just kept reading what came next like this is an ordinary book. This book is crazy insane. How are you even acting like this is an ordinary book? You die without even having chosen your oh, character. No. The end. And your final score is maybe learn to read books better sometime out of a thousand. No. Dude, that's not a very good score, I gotta say. All right, let me try it again. To be or not to be. That's the adventure. Ryan North. Let's see. I'll do that later. I'm going to choose a character. You have just been born. Congratulations. Good work Hooray! on that thing. Now, surprise! Babies are boring, so we're going to jump ahead in time to a point where you're an adult, and you've already lived a bunch of your life. But I promise most of what we're skipping over was really dull. 
You ate a lot and slept a lot and made some friends, tears were shed, makeouts were totally had, etc. It was a bunch of high school stuff. The awesome stuff starts now. So, let's begin, my friend. Um, remind me again who you are. Are you Ophelia? She's an awesome lady in her late 20s with a calm, competent, and resourceful demeanor. She's got a plus one bonus to science, but she's also got a minus one <laughs> weakness against water. So heads up. Also, I believe... Hamlet? He's an emo teen in his early 30s. Also, he's the Prince of Denmark. Hamlet has a plus one resistance to magic, but there's no magic in this adventure, so this never gets mentioned again as of right now. Hamlet Sr.? He's the King of Denmark, 50 years old. He's super good at fighting and leading men into battle and naps. Let's say plus one to each? Look, bottom line, he's an unstoppable machine of death. <laughs> and should you choose to be him, you may experience kingly glory. Play as Ophelia. Play as Hamlet. Play as Hamlet Sr. The fact that I can't play as Polonius is actually kind of depressing. But I was going to say that uh, Kate Bishop, or not Kate Bishop, ha, huh? Kate Beaton, you can tell I'm really tired. Uh, Kate Beaton was actually one of the artists on this because I recognized her work. I really, I, I got to play as Ophelia because I love Ophelia. So let's do that first. Right. You're Ophelia. You are a beautiful and independent young woman. And although it makes you roll your eyes when you think about it, you've fallen in love with a prince. Prince Hamlet is funny and charming, and he seems to like you a lot. You try not to get too excited about it, because you're worried you might jinx it. But things really are going great. Only... Only it's been hard doing the long distance thing while you've both been off at university. And while you've loved studying capital S science, and you're sure Hamlet's loved studying capital U undeclared, it hasn't been easy. Now that you're both back together in Denmark for his father's funeral and his mother's second wedding, it's been harder still. Hamlet's really sad, and you can't blame him for that since, you know, his dad died. But you wish there was something you could do to help him. When you last saw him, Hamlet mentioned how the castle seemed cold and drafty, and for some reason it stuck with you. You've been sitting at your desk, trying to think of something you could give him that would help with that. A way of cheering him up a little. Remind him he's still got people who care about him. He wears these cloaks all the time, but then he's taking them off in warm rooms and putting them back on in cold ones. If only there was some way you could keep the rooms at a uniform temperature, he wouldn't need to be constantly adjusting his clothes throughout the day. But to do that, you'd need some way of measuring heat, and a way of transporting it through the castle, perhaps through a series of pipes. <laughs> your thoughts are interrupted by a knock at your door. Who is it? You call. It's me, says your brother. Come on, let me in. Let him in. Tell him you're busy. Hmm. Wouldn't tell him I'm busy. I'm busy, you shout through the door to Larity's. I'm leaving for France soon, he shouts back. Don't you want to say goodbye? Apparently not, you shout in reply. Whatever, Larity's yells. He storms off, stomping all the way. You sit in silence for a moment. He stomps back. Say bye to Dad for me, okay? He shouts. Okay, I will, you yell through the door. He storms off again. To France, I guess? Brothers, am I right? Return to... All right. At your desk, you continue your work on the problem of automatically heating the castle. Hours turn into days and you're generally left alone by both your family and your boyfriend. Your father ignoring you is no big deal. And while you're a little worried about Hamlet not stopping by more often, he has asked you to leave him alone for a while while he mourns, and you're respecting his wishes. But if you're going to be honest with yourself... You've also just gotten really absorbed in this problem. You decide to split the problem into sections, delivering heat and knowing when to deliver heat. It would be possible to put servants in every room and have them report when it's too cold, but that's both expensive <laughs> and unreliable. It depends on the servant, the warmth of their clothes, how much they love to lie to people about what temperature their skin is sensing, and so on. You're wandering the castle grounds when it hits you. You've been thinking about how water expands when it freezes and how that could be used to tell you when it's cold but it's not much use for measuring temperatures outside the freezing point. Your father, Polonius, happens to wander by, talking to himself about the evils of drink. And you realize, alcohol! The right alcohol would expand linearly with heat, and by putting it in a slender glass vial, you could measure the size of that liquid, which would correspond one to one with temperature. Put the same markings on each of these glass vials at the same temperatures, and you've got a universal, comparable, and consistent way of measuring heat. 
you wouldn't have to rely on a servant's impression. They could just tell you what line the alcohol has reached. You run back to your room to start working on the prototype. Just as you complete it, you hear a knock at your door. Who is it? You call. And oh my, who should answer from the other side of the door? Seriously, who should answer from the other side of the door? Your boyfriend, Hamlet. Your father, Polonius. Your best friend, Dramisio Mimus. Hmm. I'm going to try the Hamlet. You decide you want Hamlet to be on the other side of the door. Open it, and <laughs> Hamlet really is at the door. That's so freaky. How, how'd you do that? Hamlet steps into your room. You haven't seen each other for a while. It's so great to see him. You run up and throw your arms around him and you kiss. It's just like old times. But the moment passes, and when you look at his face, you can see concern written all over it. He's troubled by something. Ask him what's troubling him. Wait for him to tell you. I'll wait for him to tell you. You wait, doing nothing, and he pulls away from you and holds you at arm's length. Listen, he says, and then he begins unbuttoning his jacket, taking his garters off, and, <laughs> oh gosh, yes, he's actually doing it. He's fouling his stockings. What's wrong, Hamlet? You ask in alarm. What you say next sounds like the obvious question, but you ask it anyway. <laughs> Why are you fouling your stockings? Instead of answering, he grabs you by the wrist. You come to the entirely obvious conclusion that he's not acting like himself. This conclusion is reinforced in the next few moments, when he moves his other hand to his forehead as if he might faint. But instead of fainting, he stares at you intensely. Hamlet, I don't know why you're doing this, you begin, and he sighs really loudly. It's the most <laughs> intense sigh you've ever heard. It's actually kind of impressive. Look, if you'll just talk to me, we can wi- You begin, and he sighs again, so loudly that it literally drowns out your words. Fine, weirdo. Let's play the wrist-holding game. Yay! You meet his eyes, and he sighs one of those ultimate sighs again, then gets up and leaves in what can only be described as the creepiest way possible, hmm. walking with his head wrenched over his shoulder so he can watch you even as he crab walks out the door. Well, that was weird. Maybe he's sick. You decide to check in with your dad because as annoying as he is, he does have some experience in these matters. Follow Hamlet and ask him what's wrong. Maybe you can help him sort things out. I don't trust Polonius, so I'm going to follow Hamlet. You ask him what's wrong, and, well, there's no other way to put this, so I'll give it to you straight. Hamlet tells you about a spooky ghost and a plan for murdering his stepfather Claudius, pretender to the throne. I'll be frank, it sounds crazy. A ghost? Murder? But he is your friend and lover, and you're not going to leave him hanging out to dry. As gently as you can, you tell him you're pretty sure ghosts don't exist. But even if they do, he needs to be certain that the ghost he saw was actually the ghost of his father. What if it was some other ghost trying to mess things up? That seems to give him pause. Hamlet admits he never actually asked the ghost for information only his dad would know. <laughs> it's possible the ghost could be an imposter. I'll come with you tonight, sweetie, you say. We'll go together, and if a ghost shows up, we'll figure out what to do. You're confident no ghost will appear, and this will all just go away. You take his hand and squeeze. Hamlet looks up at you, and you can see his relief. Okay, he says, smiling. Go to see the ghost that evening. All right. Evening comes, and Hamlet leads you to the spot outside where he first saw the ghost. We have to wait till around midnight, he says. I think that's when he normally shows up. To pass the time, you play a storytelling game you enjoy where you say one word of a story, and he says the next word, and neither of you knows where the story will go. Once, you begin. Upon, he says. A, you say. Time, he says. There, you say. Was, he says. A, you say. Beautiful, he says, looking at you. You smile. Prince, you reply, and he smiles back. Who, he says. Wanted, you say. Two, he says. Kiss, you say. Ooh. His girlfriend, he says. <laughs> That's cheating, you say. And then you're kissing. 
Make out for a while. Don't make out, because, and you can't believe you're thinking this, but what if a ghost catches you making out? I'll make out for a while, let her be happy. You make out for what turns out to be quite a while. As the night is warm and the stars are stunning and there are no bugs here to bite any exposed flesh, and before you know it, you've totally made out as much as it's possible to totally make out. Nice. <laughs> and you fall asleep in each other's arms. If ghosts exist, and if one really did show up, he certainly had the good grace to leave you alone for your makeouts. Also, he was probably embarrassed. You were both way naked. <laughs> the two of you return to the same spot the next evening, and the evenings after that. But it becomes more and more a date night, and less and less a a specter from beyond the grave wants to get some murders done thing. King Claudius and Polonius are not exactly thrilled with the two of you being together. But on the flip side, any urges to commit regicide that were floating around have begun to fade too. Though you talk about it often, the whole encounter with the ghost, if it really did happen, takes on the quality of a dream. Rather than do the long distance thing again, you decide to move in together and get your own place here in Denmark. Together, the two of you work on finalizing the invention of the alcohol thermometer. It works. And even figure out the other half of it, a way to move heated air throughout a building. Congratulations, <laughs> you invented central heating. It's an invention that all of Denmark wants, and most are willing to pay for. While it's not the largest, you do live in the most comfortable estate in the entire country, thanks to the heating money. One bright summer day, as the two of you walk through the castle garden, you get down on one knee and say words to the effect of, Sweetie, you're the most important person in my life, and I can't imagine ever living without you. I want to make you as happy as you make me every single day. Let's get married. You mean every word. It's not the most traditional proposal in the world, nor is it the most traditional wedding, but it's wonderful and beautiful and perfect. You're very happy. You don't invite Claudius to the wedding. A few years later, Claudius falls ill with some sort of lung disease, and his doctors are unable to treat it effectively. He passes away only a few months later, having never produced an heir. Shortly after, the two of you become the new king and queen of all of Denmark. Your first child, Alex, is born five months later, and you all live very happily ever after. The end. I totally kicked butt on this game. On the first try, I totally... Come on! What? I think that was just a random thing. I think... Socking is befouled, choice is made, times you were, times you were not, ace of tennis played, Rosencrantz's, Guildensterns. I created a better story than Shakespeare! I did a way better job. Hooray for me. Um... I will do one more, and I hate to I hate to not leave on this high note, but I haven't been playing for that long. But I would just like to point out that no matter what I do after this, I got Ophelia not only through the game, through the through the story where she's happily married and queen of Denmark. I also helped her create the thermometer and centralized heating. That is the thing that happened in this game. And I did it on the first try, baby. I did awesome. Go me. Um, from that, I, I can either start at a checkpoint, restart the event, or show the credits. I think... I think I want to restart the adventure and see if I can survive as... Uh, this time I'm not going to enable narration. I am just going to try speaking myself. You can toggle narration at any time in the option. Okay. No, skip. Skip! Alright. Uh, choose my character. I've been born. Good luck with that. Yes, yes, yes. Have I seen all this? Uh, play as Hamlet Sr. and see if I can survive. You are King Hamlet. All of Denmark is under your command. Everything's going great for you. At present, you are in Norway, which 
Just this afternoon, you led Denmark's forces to an astounding victory during which you personally killed the Norwegian king. Stabbed it right through the head, you did. His eyes popped out and rolled on the ground, and then you stepped on it. Whoa, your ass is bad. You are a bad ass. You decide after a day of being good at fighting, you should have a nap. You've earned it. You settle down in an orchard for some nappy times. All right, here's the first thing. If I am already, if I do not get a choice before I take the nap, I'm pretty much screwed because guess what? The map is when he's murdered. During your rest over the light, aha, your brother poisons, uh, pours some poison in your ear and you die. Achievement get, not to be. You... Surprise, you didn't know poisons worked that way. Aha, uh -huh, wow, you've already made one choice so far, and you're already dead already. Way to go, champ. You're really good at books, huh? You're doing a subtle job here, reading chuckles. The end. Ah, uh, dang it. But I found a good piece of artwork. Oh, good, I get to do that. Cool. Um, I'll become a ghost. Good news, the afterlife exists and it's full of ghosts. You know this because you are now one of them. You had all your time slamming doors when all the chains and telling all the person who killed you. But the th here's the thing, I, the author, told you, the reader, that your brother poison poured poison in your ear while he napped. But you, Sam Senior, have no idea how you died. Except through the whole thing. So you need to figure out who killed you if you're going to revenge yourself or on your murderer. Assuming you were even murdered. But, because remember that, for all you know, you could have died of a heart attack. This is only an example of dramatic irony, since we're in the second person. It's an amazing example of entirely new species of dramatic irony. Something I like to call second person pronoun paradoxal autodramatic irony. You're now aware of information you're not aware of. This should be fun. It should be fun of any kind of irony. Uh, except that you died of a heart attack. Listen in on people's conversations, see if they talk. Let's do that. Hang around Norway for a bit, trying to listen in on what people are saying, but don't speak in Norwegian. You only speak Danish, so understanding Norwegian is a little different. Difficult. It all sounds like Swedish to you. Which actually makes a lot of sense since Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish are all related North Germanic languages. Descended from early, you nod your head, agreeing that this is all very accurate and extremely interesting. While these three languages are generally supposed to be mutually in intelligible, you find you can understand Norwegian Swede only if you're concentrating, which you are, and they're speaking slowly and clearly, which they are not, as everyone is running around upset about war and all these kings getting killed. Ironically, Norwegian speakers can understand Danish easier than Danish speakers understand Norwegian, but that doesn't help you much. It would be useful if you were playing as Norwegian king, whose ghost has stowed away on your army's boat headed back to Denmark. But I haven't given you that option, even though it would be extremely awesome. And you're wondering what happens to this eventual ghost, and I can tell you the answer exists in your imagination? But here's the good news. It turns out written Danish and written Norwegian are pretty similar. So you spend the next several nights haunting people, quietly reading their diaries while they sleep in their beds, and you don't know this. But ghosts do this all the time. Ghosts just love sneaking a peek at the secrets of the living. It takes a while, but you finally find the diary of someone who wrote on the day you died. She's wandering by a garden, minding her business. When she saw some Danish guy pour something in some Danish guy's ear. Hey, that sounds like it could have happened to you. But remember, you don't know that's exactly what happened to you because of the new irony we invented. Uh... Let's do the ask. I'm assuming that both of them are going to be like, you can't do that, you're a ghost. Grab a piece of paper and write down the words, hey, I'm not here to kill you, I just want to know what that murder you may have whispered. But in Danish, haha, of course. Shake the woman awake while holding the piece of paper in front of her. She freaks out initially. She just woke up by a ghost, the apparition behind the, from beyond the grave. But once she reads her note, uh, she looks at you specifically. I can't talk. Goes for real? You flip over the paper and write, yeah, I'm the guy that got killed, maybe, and I guess I want to revenge my death or whatever. But please speak slowly, as Norwegian is my native language. I am from Denmark. Oh, the woman says in Danish, I speak Danish too. Kick ass, you reply. She tells you what she saw and gives you a physical description of the guy. Unfortunately, the man answered to your search could only be the one person, your brother Claudius. Congratulations, my king. You now know 
uh, so that the whole second person paradoxal pronoun, second person pronoun paradoxal auto dramatic irony thing has been slain. Plus five experience, new quest, revenge yourself on Claudius. You've been awarded 500 experience points, plus you've unlocked a new quest, revenge yourself on Claudius. Feel pretty chuffed about this whole situation. Okay, let's revenge your death. Your murderer is getting away with it in Denmark. <sighs> Swim back to Denmark. It's like 200 kilometers between the two nations. You know that, right? Apparently not. So you swim back to Denmark, but it's a lot of work to keep your body corporeal so that you can swim, so eventually you get tired and stop. For a while you float above the water, but then it gets boring, so for the most of your journey, you float to the floor and travel along it. Hey, there's a sunken pirate ship here. Hey, there might be treasure in it. Sure, why not examine it? Oh man, it's awesome. It'd be so cool to be an underwater explorer who does not need to breathe. It's sort of hard to see it without a light source. Your ghostly body glows a little when you want, so it's not that bad. The pirate ship sink itself seems recently sunk. There are bodies trapped below, and yeah, that's unpleasant. The ocean bacteria haven't really began disposing them. Bodies, man, being corporeal, man, I don't know. You find the treasure ship and it's empty. It seems like the ship was attacked, raided, right and then sunk. Somewhere along your head, sailing on the surface of the great ocean Atlantic, and is a really tough pirate ship that is looking for treasure and or trouble. Too bad you're already dead, huh? But even if you were alive, what does a ghost need with money anyway? So I guess it's been kind of a pointless, but it's an awesome endeavor. You've explored the ocean bottom and found a sunken ship. Don't let anyone tell you that's not awesome. Okay, after several more days of very slow travel that we just skipped over because it gets boring, we are back on Denmark shores. Under the sea. Da 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 da. In Denmark, you know what? I go back and sort of. I want to just get through this. You make it back to Denmark. The first thing you want to do is track down your brother and take revenge. Turns out really easy because he's in the first place. Check the royal court. He's there with your brother, Roger Gucci. Weird. They're acting all close and stuff. Oh, well, he's probably just trying to comfort her after your untimely death. Ha ha. Brothers are really great. Oh, maybe not? Let's ignore what they're saying. Using spooky ghost powers, you completely ignore Gertrude and what they say to you. That evening, you try to revenge yourself on Claudius by spooking him. The problem is, he never looks in any of the mirrors you're haunting. He assumes wind is knocking over his pots. And he thinks the ghostly wailing from beyond the grave is probably just a sick dog outside who's having a really rough go of it lately. Spooking him isn't going well, man. You know what to... Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. You have... I am having trouble talking because it's super late at night and I'm going to have to go to bed soon. But I'm going to try to get through this and help Hamlet Sr. revenge his own death. So we will get through this. I don't know what to tell you. You'll have to get your revenge some other way. Maybe by killing him? Reflecting on the fact that he did kill you, you decide that the only suitable revenge is to kill him as well. Because why not? You could totally take him. Especially since you're already, you've already died once and lived to talk about it. But who's best suited to do the killing? You could do it, but you did have a son, uh, partially so you wouldn't have to do every single thing around here. Now, kill Claudius yourself. You know how Hamlet is in the play. Kill him yourself. Right, because who better to know how to kill someone than someone who's already been through that getting killed to death process themselves? You wait until Claudius is sleeping next to your beloved Gertrude for some reason. Haha, <laughs> that's weird. And wake him up by tapping him on the forehead a bit. It's me, your brother. Or, hey, it's me, you whisper. Your brother, the one you murdered. Ah, crap. With, with our ghosts are real. Real pissed at you anyway, you reply. Listen, I'll cut to the chase. We are from a time when an eye for an eye is considered to be a good thing to build a justice system around. So I'm going to, I am here to kill you. How? Claudius asks, his eyes wide terrified. Ah, oh, geez, so many ways. You say, counting them off the, of your fingers. I could startle you and make you have a heart attack, but that would take time. I could throw a pot at your head until you die, but that lacks grace. Instead, check this out. You move your ghost body so it floats right above Claudius. He stares at you, eyes wide. I'm sorry, he whispers. Way too late for that, you reply. You lower yourself to him face to face and keep going. His face dominates your field vision, and then you're inside your brain, inside the pink of his brain, his blood darkly obscuring your sight. You sink slowly deeper and deeper into him, lined up your bo your ghost body with his regular body until you are occupying the exact same space. 
Then you make yourself corporeal. What happens next uh, happens so quickly and with such force it's hard to describe, but Claudius explodes everywhere, captures most of it. I mean, you're fine, but man, that is disgusting. Literally disgusting. Gertrude waits up, dripping in gore and screaming. My, you, my friend, have achieved revenge. Still corporeal, you roll over to your back and apologize to Gertrude. You explain to her, you explain over her screen what happened, so you'll, you'll hope she'll be happy with being married to a ghost. Gertrude stops screaming. Um, while you were gone, I kind of married Claudia, she said, but I never stopped loving you. Understand that, just as you have more than one good friend at a time, the human heart is capable of loving more than one person at a time. Be cool with it. Get upset that she you married your brother. I'm going to go with the first one to see where it goes. Hooray, Gertrude says, hugging you. She's covering your brother's guts, but it's still a nice moment. I must say, you have done really well, King Hamlet. Not only have you revenged yourself in record time, you've also reconciled with your widow. Nicely done. You reveal yourself to the royal court the next morning, and nobody's happier to see you than your son, Hamlet Jr. Your re reappearance as a ghost does cause a minor constitutional crisis when someone points you out you might not be able to resume the throne. But a quick flip through the Constitution reveals that nothing says in the rules that a ghost can't be king. There's actually a section that explicitly says that this should happen. The ghost assuming the throne should be total, would be totally neato. I'm serious. That's what it says. It says totally neato. You've got yourself a pretty cool nation, Hamlet Sr. You rule with your wife by your side for a really long time and even get help solving national problems from the ghosts of history's greatest rulers, many of whom become personal close friends. Mega points! Your final score is 3,400. Mega points, and I'm really proud of you. Nicely done. The end. I would just like to point out that in my first two tries in this game, I have both made life exceedingly better for both Gertrude and for the ghost of, the, of Hamlet, King of Denmark. I am kind of awesome at this game, and obviously I should have been one who was making all these decisions in the story from the get-go. So yay for me. Ah. Hooray! Congratulations, you found a piece of artwork. Alright, let's see how I did. I don't know if I can do anything. Ah, can I go back? Well, apparently I messed up. Uh, potions misused, choices made, times you were, times you were not. Bears married. <laughs> Game of tennis played. Rosencrantz of Guild and Cerns. I created a better story, story than Shakespeare. Again. So, um, with that... I am exhausted. It's been a very long day, and I know I need to go to sleep. But this has been really fun, and I am looking forward to a time when I can do another Let's Play for this, because um, this was really fun. And I want to see if I can actually uh, get Hamlet to Happy Ending on the first try, because I think I can um, by just doing everything the opposite of what Hamlet actually does in the play. I f that, that's kind of the thing about this. Like, if you if you don't do what Shakespeare did, suddenly, suddenly their lives are a lot better. Um, but yeah, I'm exhausted, so I'll see you guys next time.